All right, so uh, Here we go. I'd like to start out this morning by thanking our sponsors and seeing maybe if they could come up and talk about uh, what they do and why they're uh, in, so greatly involved in the community. So Chris Singh, Mike Cole, uh, who's from here from North Star Reach? Come on up. And uh, also Roger Rail. So Mike, can you, uh, well, let's see, let's Chris go first. We'll do, we'll do the polite ladies first. Good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Raymond, a professional service firm. Awesome we have a quiet place. Thank you. Raymond is a professional service firm with an awesome office here in Ann Arbor. I'm joined by several of my colleagues. I'm impressed how many got up early. I see Daniel Clark back there, Mike McCarthy. I saw Adam Williams come in, I think, and Debbie Crown. So thank you for joining us. One thing we wanted to mention is as a firm, the tax professionals in our firm are spending a lot of time understanding and strategizing the tax bill. Unfortunately, not everyone is a winner. So please consider us a resource. And if you have any questions, reach out. You have a lot of us in the room today, and we'd be happy to help you navigate. It's our newest sponsor, North Star Reach. Good morning. I'm Louisa Artelt, and I'm with North Star Reach, and I'm new with the um, agency. So, but it's basically it's a camp that was created in Pinckney for children with serious health challenges. And we're new, but we're growing. And we partner with 12 different hospitals and or health systems. So we're growing and serving more children. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And uh, can I just borrow yes. that one minute, please? Uh, uh, so we're, this is a little bit different situation. If we actually are promoting North Star Reach, they're not they're a sponsor, but in the sense that we are able through the other great uh, community facilities and, and organizations to provide this free to you. Ziggerman's is another sponsor, Roger Rail and his company, do the video, which is on YouTube. But we're gonna make North Star Reach this year the recipient of uh, our largesse. So people, please keep in mind, if you wanna to contribute to this effort, uh, you please can, you know, talk to Louisa about North Star Reach, and uh, it's a cause that I very strongly support. Thank, Thank you. you, we're so grateful. Thank you. Oh, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Cole. Louisa, nice to meet you. A great client of Bank of Ann Arbor's. Oh, yes, thank you for here. Um, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Michael Cole with Bank of Ann Arbor. I head up a group here at the bank called the Technology Industry Group. So my group focuses on working with tech companies in town and venture capital firms. But we're a full-service bank, helping people from everywhere from buying a house to buying a business. Uh, we've got uh, eight offices from Ann Arbor to Birmingham, um, and we're my group is 16 years old now, so I got to get a new thing here. Uh, so the bank's about 26 years old, uh, born and raised in Ann Arbor. And it's, it's great to have Thomas back in Ann Arbor. Uh, he's going to talk a lot about space travel and stuff today, but I got to know Thomas when he was at the University of Michigan, really working a lot in the entrepreneurial community and helping to build this ecosystem. So it's great to have you back, Thomas. Thank you. Yeah, Michael, can you just uh, mention the uh, tech uh, party thing you're going to do, the uh, thing at the uh, December? It's, 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 it's always a tech party going on in town. <laughs> uh, but the uh, thing that we started last year is called the Ann Arbor Tech City Jam. And so at the end of the year, December 14th this year, um, at the Neutral Zone, they have a, uh, a full kind of music facility in the back of the Neutral Zone, if you haven't been there. We bring uh, musicians from the tech community together. So last year we had about 30 musicians and we have live, we have a live show um, and we'll have uh, a couple hundred people there. So it's, it's a really fun event. So if you're interested in that, let me know. We can get you on the mailing list for that. Can you get David Bloom to play? Or David Bloom will be there. All right. Yes, you betcha. Well, thank you very much yeah. for sponsoring. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks. Okay. All right, I want to call up a couple other people. Uh, if they could come up, so Elisa, uh, I think Rich Sheridan, uh, Britt, Brittany, and Mike. Matt, you guys got to keep up. I just, one of the things about Leaders Connect, as you know, when you've been here, is we try to talk about great things that are happening in the community or needs in the community and let people know uh, what's happening. And also, uh, I just wanted to introduce a few of So one of them is the, uh, uh, Lisa, your last name is Geichten. And she's from the Yankee Air Museum, which is one of our great uh, tributes here and facilities here. So maybe you guys can talk about what you're doing and what you're trying to raise the money for. Absolutely. 
Good morning, everyone. Um, like I said, I am Elisa Guyton with the Yankee Air Museum, and we have an amazing project that we're working out out at Historic Willow Run. We have a museum that's been open since 1981, and what we're doing is we're renovating the original bomber plant from 1942. We saved 3% of the original bomber plant building, um, which is about 144,000 square feet. Holy. <laughs> it's, and it's amazing. When you step into the building, if those walls could talk, it's amazing. So our campaign is $20 million. We've raised eight point, or five. It's a $20 million campaign. We've raised 8.5, 1.2 of which has been gifts and kind contractors coming on board and helping us. It's an exciting time. Um, one thing I would love to highlight is our Unity and Learning Project, which is a partnership with Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum, Leslie Science and Nature Center, and they are taking over our educational programming. We had summer camps out at the museum this summer with kids. Oh, it was amazing. Anyways, if you'd like to hear more information or learn more about what we're doing, please let me know afterwards. I'd be happy to talk. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. So is, to get, is there a website that people could go to if they want to learn more? SaveTheBomberPlant.com. SaveTheBomberPlant.com. Okay, yep. great. great. How many Thank people you. have a connection with that from families having worked there? Or uh, I know my, my family worked there during the war, so lots of, uh, lots of connections. Nice. Thank you very great. much. Thank you. Uh, so next is Matt. Come on up, Matt. And uh, Matt is going to tell us a little bit about what's going on at Google. Because he's one of, are you, uh, I wonder, if we, I don't get your title right, so you can say that, but uh, sure. I don't want to demo you. Maybe I can promote you. That was my executive director, CEO of Google, right? Is that <laughs> I, can tell you, I can tell you right now, in front of, I'm uh, not going in front of any Senate committees. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, Matt Drizwicki, uh, like Dr. Rob said, I. I Work out of our Ann Arbor office uh, up on the, uh, the north side of campus, north side of Ann Arbor, uh, Traverwood. We are about two and a half years in into a new facility. For those of you who know or remember, we started downtown many years ago uh, above Vinology uh, with a very small crew of, of folks. Grew to a, a place over at Division and Liberty, and then a couple years ago moved up to a, a new campus that continues to grow, uh, uh, which we are very excited about. Uh, our presence here. We actually today celebrate our 12 year anniversary uh, being wow. in the city of Lots of, uh, I will be leaving here to lots of fun and fanfare up in our, uh, up in our campus up, uh, of, of Traverwood. Um, Google itself uh, just turned, as we were talking about 15 years of tech, years, uh, we just turned 20 last month. So we talk about at Google that we are almost of legal age to drink. Uh, uh, and so also uh, very exciting for, for us. We, for those of you who don't know, we are uh, mainly a sales and service office. Those are uh, really our roots uh, for our Ann Arbor office. Um, we are really part of this, is, uh, uh, as of recently, we started looking, we're really about Google Michigan and not just Ann Arbor. So again, for some of you who know, we just opened up a new office in Detroit, which is actually right inside of uh, Little Caesars Arena. With the, the Google is about as high as this, the, the sign's about as oh, high as Oh, the signage? Yeah, uh, yeah. I was actually I've been in that office the last two days. I was a bit uh, shocked at how uh, at how big the signage is for those people who have been down there. It's quite you can quite see prominent. It from, you can see it from Canada. You can. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we may be. Uh, it is that spec I've been told, but we may be maybe reducing the size of it. But in any event, we. Uh, 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 so again, sales and service office up in uh, up in Ann Arbor. Um, we uh, we are constantly uh, we are continuing to grow. Quite frankly, and we are constantly looking to recruit. Uh, young folks right up both undergrad as well as graduate programs into this office. We'd love to see it grow. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will be around here for the next little bit. And, and Matt, I, I know you got a very nice auditorium there, so you know what I what I'd love to do is be able to host one of these events here. You know, it's one a good pitch. Yeah. Good yeah. pitch. Good no pitch. All right, let's see. That sounds good. Right, no pressure. You want to commit in front of the audience? <laughs> if I were CEO, I would be able to do uh, that right now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're probably to figure something out. Uh, so, Brittany, you come up next because she's got a, a little bit of a. This is a this is a boot of shame, but but actually through triathlon, right? So yeah. you got it. You got it. Uh, it's shameful because when you have an injury and it hurts, maybe you should stop. <laughs> uh, but it's healing. So uh, I'm. Hold it real close. Yeah, I see. Uh, Roger will yell at me. Um, 
So I am the executive director for the University Research Corridor, and I know many of you in the room are familiar with us, but for those who may not, we are an alliance of Michigan's big three research institutions. Um, the only three, what Carnegie classifies as research ones in our state. And I just want to say before she goes into talking a little bit more about it, the reason I asked Brittany to come up is not only to talk about it, but to congratulate her on becoming the executive director. So it was just announced a couple months ago. We and, right uh, before Mackinac. And okay. we've been talking for a couple of years about it, so I want to just give Brittany yeah. a hand. a big part of our charter is to um, measure our collective value and effectively communicate that to our stakeholders. Those stakeholders include industry leaders, like many of you in the room, um, legislators, I don't know if there's anyone here at the office, uh, and also the media. Because I think that there's a need to really clarify where the value is in having research universities. Not all states have at least three. In fact, more than half have fewer than three. So we're kind of in a, in a special group of states. And so what does that mean? And so we measure our impact uh, every other year. We just did it in September. We had $18.7 billion in economic impact across the state. And let me be clear that that hit every single county in our state, so no one's left out. Um, and that, you know, I like to say too, one way we do that is our institutions, as many of you know, are very different, but very complementary. We cannot have the depth of impact that we have without Wayne State in Detroit, our biggest city. We can't have the scale of research that we have without U of M. And we can't have the reach that we have across the state without MSU. So it's, we're really fortunate to have that kind of uh, complementary set of big research institutions. And I do want to point out, uh, we do a series of uh, reports. And a, a report we did a couple years ago, we focused on talent and the value our institutions have in bringing talent to the much like our speaker today. He's But also, we have a couple people here who we profiled in that report, including Rich's daughter, who came back to the area, and uh, also my friend Jim, who's his first time here, Jim Rains, who's a uh, space plasma researcher and worked with Thomas. Another one of those space plasma researchers. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jim, I know you've told me many times, I still don't know what that is. <laughs> um, but Jim was actually really an interesting case, because he was once a high school teacher, and then got in, did his PhD at U of M, and now is a researcher for U of M. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, congratulations. And uh, next I want to turn the mic over to somebody who's been around Leaders Connect and actually affiliated with it for probably 20 years or so. So uh, Rich and I, uh, many years ago, as part of Leaders Connect, we're doing something called Michigan Leaders Read. And uh, we, we presented a book, I think Good to Great might have been our first. And Rich got so inspired in that, we ran out of books, he started writing his own. So uh, we're gonna feature Rich in 2020, don't know this yet, but as one of our speakers. Uh, but you maybe could tell us about the new book that's coming out. I, I was kidding with him, this first is called Joy Inc. The first one. Yeah, yep. yeah. And I say, well, your next one must be stress ink, but yeah. that's not fear. Fear. Not fear. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Fear. exactly. <laughs> well, good morning. It's great to be here. Good to see you, Thomas. Uh, uh, Thomas knows that uh, my long-term dream is to one day help build the Starship Enterprise, uh, and so he's my guy. Uh, I know there will be a lot of software in there, so uh, <laughs> that's the way computers are supposed to work, right? Um, yeah, I just uh, finished writing another book. Uh, actually, fun for me. I got to read the audio version as well. Fun for me. Uh, and um, it's called Chief Joy Officer, and it was for the leadership component of what we built at Menlo, as well as other leaders I've met along the way. Uh, but it talks about eliminating fear and elevating the human energy of our teams. Great, so. great. We'll look forward to that. Be in the bookstores and on Amazon. Uh, and December 4th. You can pre-order now. <laughs> actually, I always wonder when I pre-order from Amazon whether they're actually going to charge me when that comes up or they're going to let me know the book is available. But that was a little fear, but this one I, I want to have, so I will definitely order. And I, just a, a couple of quick other things. Uh, we've got um, lots of people in the audience. I just wanted to 
have you stand up if you fit, fit into this category. Some of you may stand up more than once. Uh, if you are involved in uh, entrepreneurship, please stand up. Okay. All right, so just keep standing for a minute. Look around. Uh, lots of people there. Rich. Uh, okay. Chuck. Chuck. Chuck is uh, sitting. Gordon. Richard Lawrence. And we got some serial entrepreneurs. Chuck is sitting. Gordon Amadon has been an entrepreneur in the uh, pharmaceutical. How long has your company been in business? Uh, 25 years. 25 years. Can anybody be in the back? For, uh, yeah. Still standing? <laughs> 27. Say your company? Motawi Tile. Motawi Tile. And all the latest spaceships are going to have Motawi Tile. <laughs> uh, okay, so thank you for entrepreneurship. Uh, how about medical, medical advice, health care? Or are you still, still standing? Uh, here for medical, uh, medical device. That first Neil out there, Neil Clinton is here. Uh, medical device. So okay, several of those. Let's see what other categories here. How about the arts? John, you can not stand up anymore. Or in the future, in the future. Okay, the arts. So Mario, can you say what your new art project is? It's interesting. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Alliance for the Arts and Research University a national organization that's focused on how to maintain an active presence and role for arts, arts integration, and disciplinarity in research universities. Okay, we have Michael from the Regents here. We're from Michael. And our reserve festival executive director and department of board chair this year. Okay, and Lee, probably nobody knows about your place, but maybe you can try to promote it. Yeah, in theater and state theater. I'm probably here by now that the state theater reopened at the end of last year all renovated but you may not know that the mission theater just installed all new seats new screen new projection equipment and uh 7.1 surround sound so there's it's the best movie viewing experience it's ever had great we just saw my wife and i just saw the wife last last week we've been talking about it ever since amazing movie with playing close playing an amazing role in it so uh how about the financial community Financial services, lots of people with that. All right, we've already heard from a few. Great, okay, good. Let's got the dish out there for you, Chris. Okay, do your best. Uh, how about the digital world? Internet, uh, anything in the digital design? Don, what's your latest serial uh, entrepreneurship activity? We help manufacturers with legacy machinery that they can't replace for eight or 10 or 15 years get internet connectivity so they can light up the black hole in the middle of their data galaxy. Excellent. And no, stay standing because I just want to have uh, introduce uh, Chuck also serial entrepreneurs, people who have started more than one business, whether they've succeeded or failed. Chuck, Sean, Sam, started, yeah, okay. So at least three, uh, David, you're probably in that category too, David Bloom. Uh, I guess I would be somewhat in that category too, more in the social entrepreneurship world, but good. Uh, what have I missed here? Uh, government, anybody from government? Me. How about the uh, nonprofit world? Anybody from nonprofit? Again, we have a lot of folks here. Now this is not, this is, you're officially a non-profit, not that you're not making a profit. <laughs> but I'm going to say we have a lot of institutes in town that, we, that uh, employ people we don't hear from very often. What is, uh, what did you, did you do, Bob? Uh, Bob Mary from Arbor Research Collaborative for Health. Uh, we, uh, we, we now are just are, uh, old enough to drink, uh, uh, so about 21 years uh, in the Ann Arbor area. Uh, now building a new uh, building, a new facility to expand our operations uh, in the Domino's Farms office park. Should be open about a year from now. Uh, we have about 150 people working on everything from health policy uh, to improving the value of the healthcare dollar. Uh, to uh, large, coordinating large research networks around the country. And, and uh, you employ what, about 150? 150 or so. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people employed in this town of research institutes, and we don't really hear much about them, but ISR is one of the biggest ones, I guess, but uh, several others are, are, are in existence. And uh, Bob also does some research on some things that may affect people. Uh, he, he, one thing that, anybody have, at the age now where they have to get up in the middle of the night more than they used to. I just heard 
about it from some of my clients. <laughs> but Bob is doing, uh, collaborate, doing research on uh, why that happens, and you're finding a, a kind of interesting thing you told me, which is that it's not the prostate, right? That's right. Uh, so we have, Rob is referring to a study on lower urinary tract dysfunction. It's one of those things that everybody wants to talk about at the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it, this is, we're now just starting the, the second five-year cycle of NIH funding for a multi-site project. Uh, and we're looking at the influence of the brain on the urinary tract. Uh, and it turns out that uh, it may be that, uh, let's say it's all in your head. Uh, well, it turns out a lot of it may, may in fact be in your head. So there's probably a lot of things we used to say in the playground that indicated that, but I don't quite remember what <laughs> Uh, but anyway, some very interesting kind of things that are going on in town, and it's, it's very exciting to hear about. You have to tell us pretty much what uh, rocket science and plasma is. You know, I have, to do. I have no idea that that's in the blood. It's something else. So. Uh, <laughs> definitely not the blood. Not that the blood. All right. And uh, real estate. There's some people from real estate. Uh, Bill Milliken. Uh, yep. Stand up, Bill. And uh, Bill. Bill told me. Am I the only one? Yeah. <laughs> you told me recently your dad, uh, Bill, the senior's doing well. Right? We're happy to hear about that. They're 96 in March. Ex governor of the state. Okay. You know, when, when politicians were somebody we admired, right? Okay. The good old days. The good old days. <laughs> Is he thinking of running for president? Yeah, running for president. <laughs> I'd vote for him for sure. Uh, we won't go there, Rich. <laughs> Probably missed some other things, but I think uh, hopefully does anybody did get to stand. All right, all right, good. We got everybody up, and uh, now we're going to move on to the program, and we're going to talk in a little bit after the program about our next month, which is leadership in the military, which is pretty close. Eric, where's Eric Fritz? Eric is in the back. He cannot get him up front, but he's going to be the speaker of the program next month. We'll talk about that toward the end. Okay. And uh, now it's my pleasure to get started with Thomas. And I was trying to think about the right song to play. And everybody plays the same. And if I say what song we're going to play to introduce Thomas, I think everybody would, would guess what it is. So I found another song besides Rocket Man. Uh, here we go. Let's see if this works. All right, Spotify, come on, baby. Wait. Yeah, I like can wait if I get it going. All right, come on. Well, the song I'm looking for, we'll have to sing it ourselves because it doesn't seem to be. Oh, I see why. It's on my Echo Dot. How about on my phone? <laughs> It's his birthday this week, so let's sing it for him. Sing along with uh, with John and Paul. <laughs> Say it's your birthday. Can you hear that? <laughs> it's your birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Thomas, it's, it's wonderful to have you back in town. Uh, I know Thomas uh, through a couple of different areas, but Center for Entrepreneurship is a place that I have uh, taught. And uh, I remember talking to Thomas probably over 10 years ago about this vision you had about starting uh, this Center for Entrepreneurship. And, and also an entrepreneurship minor, all kinds of things that really got going at the university. I, I was uh, in a class the other night on uh, on this for, uh, we had uh, 50 students in the class. So it was really a popular undergraduate major. And uh, I guess uh, it's some, one of the things that you did, and this was after being here for 10 years as a, as a scientist. So we're gonna have, just have a conversation today about uh, what Thomas has been doing and uh, where he's going and some of the reflections on being in Arbor. So maybe you could start, Thomas, by describing what, what you are currently doing. Uh, happy to do so. Thanks so much. Uh, I gave you that uh, that little paper thing just uh, so you can uh, stare at it. And it's the fastest way of explaining what I'm doing. The first thing I want to do is uh, look at the title page. You see, it's an art, uh, you know, a piece that one of my artists puts together. Uh, you should know, uh, Marvin. I believe that art is absolutely critical to communicate science. I think without art, there is no science, and vice versa. And so for me, uh, you see. Uh, uh, 
a little graphic here at the center of which is Explorer 1, uh, which uh, of course went into the sky, the first science experiment, January 31st, 1958. And so, so basically everything we've done since then, uh, we stand on the shoulder of giants. And you know, so every mission that we could talk about comes from that. Uh, you turn over uh, at the back, you see uh, every mission that we're working on right now, if you were to count, it's 105 missions. Uh, that uh, I'm uh, honored to be part of. Uh, so there, many of these missions are uh, related uh, to the Earth. Uh, many of them, and we have a, the leading Earth science program in the world. Uh, we have uh, close to a factor of two more money than the second highest uh, uh, kind of contributor. And yes, uh, we have the largest uh, funding right now of any of the, the last years. That does not make the news, our science funding since I'm, I joined. It's up a half a billion dollars at close to 6.2 billion dollars per year. So, so that's, uh, that's uh, Earth science. Then, of course, we have planetary sciences, the missions that inspired us. Uh, for me personally, when we were really uh, little, I have a book that I carry with me everywhere I go. It's now at the NASA headquarters office, a book that my godfather gave me. I believe in inspiration being an important part of these missions, Voyager. It's one of my favorite ones, uh, still doing amazing science. Astrophysics is all about simple questions like, where are we from? How did it all start? You know, uh, we're all, of course, made out of stardust. There's many things we're learning about us, but that's astrophysics. And then heliophysics is just like Earth science affects our technological society. It's also focused on the kind of Rosetta Stone of all stars, which is our sun. Everything we've ever learned about stars, we first learned right here. Uh, about our uh, star and, and then also the environment. So, so uh, science is full of stories. I'm only going to tell you one, uh, kind of uh, open up. Uh, and, and basically, the one I'm going to tell you is, is uh, the one at the very right. I just talked about the sun. And I want to tell you uh, something that I'm really proud of, that I was uh, part of, and that is that that rocket that's there is a Delta IV Heavy. Uh, it was a rocket designed for. Uh, intelligence payloads, but we used it for the first time for a space mission because we want to get a uh, probe into the sun to really measure the atmosphere of the sun, that plasma, you know, the gas that comes out of the sun, blown away from the sun because it's so hot and accelerated to supersonic speeds and filling space around the planets. The guy who predicted that that would happen is a guy called Gene Parker. Uh, he did so as a, as a guy in his 20s during his PhD. I actually got fired over it because it was such an outrageous idea that the star may leak and kind of blow a supersonic uh, stream out. He got fired. His paper that he wrote, uh, referees came back and said, hey, um, you uh, should go to the library first before you start making outrageous claims. And that's the nice comment, he said. And the other ones, uh, were more nasty. Eugene Parker became a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, he was lucky enough that the editor of the journal was a guy called Chandra Sekhar, Nobel Prize winner, who, who was next door to him and said, look, I read your paper. I can't see anything wrong. I don't necessarily believe it, but it should be uh, considered. You look at this chart again. There are 35 missions on there that deal with Parker's work. And so what I did, uh, uh, one of the first things I did is I broke the rules. And what I did is I named the mission. You broke the rules? <laughs> I named the mission after the first time in history of NASA, uh, and by the way, all space agencies, I named the mission after a man alive, a human alive, and that was Eugene Parker. So I tell you, I was there. When that rocket went into the sky, I stood next to Parker. He was there, his family in tears, and uh, kind of in awe about the magnitude of that moment and kind of it all coming together because what it takes is not just courage to say things that are hard, but the resilience to stick with it. You are entrepreneurs recognize that each and every day for him. That was his entrepreneurial moment and kind of a moment that was there. By the way, Rocket was up there, everything was fine. And he said, Thomas, I said, uh, yes, uh, Gene, what can I do? He basically said, when are the first data coming? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much time. <laughs> He is 91. So for me, it's, it's of course about nature. Whenever I look at nature, I think I do something more important than what, what uh, I do each and every uh, day. I think nature is more important than any one of us, kind of learning about it, the, the secrets of the universe. But it's also about humans. It's about stories that are being written about, stories of discovery, about resilience. 
and that's what I would believe our program is about, and that's how we're talking about it. Sorry for the long answer. I would make everyone else shorter. <laughs> one, one quick uh, question about, I, I saw a video, uh, you know, I think about the universe, and uh, first of all, how, how, how old is air travel at all? When did we first fly? Oh, let's see. 1903, right? Yeah. The Wright brothers. A little, little over 100 years yeah. that we've actually even been off the Earth. Could you give us a sense of how big the universe is? Uh, <laughs> bigger than you think. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, what, what we've, we have a sense for the age of the universe, actually, we're, you know, there's many things about the universe that are actually remarkable. And the first one is it's actually relatively simple. So what we can do with the universe, kind of the structure of the universe, we believe we can describe in less than 10 variables. That's actually amazing if you think about it. It has to do with mass density, kind of how much dark matter there is, kind of there's a few variables. And, and that model that was predicted, it, it of course relies on, on Einstein's early uh, equations. That model has been really robust. See, the reason we learn, the way we learn about nature is not because we believe in things, it's because we try to kill the ideas and they don't want to die. <laughs> that, that's, that's how, I mean, kind of, that's what science is about. It's about doubt, not about belief, right? So, so for me, uh, that's how we know about the universe. Uh, so um, the universe uh, is, uh, we see less than one part in 10 to the 28. So it's a, a one with a 28. We see less than that is our horizon. And of course, what we're doing is we're building a telescope that will see the first stars, the first galaxies. It's called the uh, James Webb uh, Telescope. It's a big agony for me. It's like the, it's the toughest thing we've ever done as an agency, as a, as a mission. Um, has something like 350 single point failures. That means any one of these does not work, the whole telescope fails. Uh, the largest we've ever done is 87. So that would be the Mars landing you've seen, you know, with the helicopter coming down. That's, that's the most complex so far. So it's that kind of stuff we do, uh, as well as others. But yes, the universe is, is amazing. There's many questions we can address today uh, with the tools of science that were, for the last millennia, addressed and with the tools of philosophy. We can still do that. Uh, there's religion uh, in many people's minds when they think about these questions. That's good, too. But the point is, we can address them with the tool of science, such as, is there life out there? Uh, I think that it's a really exciting question that we're going after right now. Excellent. All right. So, uh, well, there's so many questions to ask you, Thomas, but maybe uh, the, the group would be interested to hear about your transition. So, how did you decide to make this switch from the university, the university track, and uh, I know you had choices to do other things. How did you decide on NASA? So uh, what I actually did is, is I did, I mean, I don't believe in career plans that I call them career plan Pope, you know, so it's really easy to define, but very unlikely you get it, especially if you're not Catholic in my case, you know, but, but so, so I, I mean, I'm always worried if students kind of make these career plans. I want to be like, I remember I did recruiting for the whole university before the students were even here. The first time they met the university and this father stood up and basically said, my daughter wants to be uh, uh, cardiologist, pediatric cardiologist, and she is one year from the end, and she has done all these AP classes, and so he gave me all the AP classes, I basically said, she has two choices, should he do AP chemistry or AP physics to make that goal more likely? I don't believe in that kind of plan. I mean, my, what I believe is in, in plans that have kind of phases, I loved every minute working with the great, like, you know, you know, Rich, that you know, I learned from you, from others who are sitting here, Marvin, about life, about being purposeful, about doing, doing tough things. And so when I came, I did the CFE uh, with a, an amazing team that deserve much more credit than I do, but I did that with, with the team, and I realized all of a sudden, I remember that moment where I realized that I'm the guy who causes the problem, not the guy who brings the solution. <laughs> and I basically, I basically felt that, I mean, I, you know, I don't know when the right time is to get off a certain thing, but I basically realized that the organization would do better if more people owned it than me, right? Kind of, I, kind of, because when I walked in, sometimes I would squelch the dialogue. Because when I said something, the good ideas actually did not come to the table. And, and so, so basically I started looking, and uh, as you know, I basically hired you 
to spend 10 hours with me to think about what I'm about. And the simple reason I did that, it's like the trainer. I hire a trainer three times in the morning to lift weights. I hate lifting weights, but I'm too cheap to let her stand by herself and lose the money. I did the same, like I thought about, you know, I don't think about myself for I hours. I hired me to lift weights. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I did that and I basically realized what, what I'm really, what I love is, is be in places that require kind of turnarounds, you know, that, that, that especially big organizations, I actually realized I'm not that good over time, starting with a blank sheet of paper, a new company. I tried that, it, it's, like, it's kind of a shame. I, I couldn't figure out how to do that. What I'm better at is in big organizations where people see walls, I see opportunities, right? Kind of, I love pushing against walls and kind of see ways to go around it, whether it's on the inside of the University of Michigan, which is in every way as big a bureaucracy as the US government, right? But, but, but basically, uh, I managed to, to basically uh, see that. And so, so basically, I was not looking to be a university leader of a university that didn't want to improve, frankly. I always asked, every time I almost went to Princeton, right? But, they didn't feel like they wanted to improve. I didn't feel like they're good people, great people, by the way, but, but I, I, that, that's not me. I'd like to be in an organization that wants to go up. And, and so, so basically what happened, frankly, I did that. I was encouraged to do the NASA interview, which was really surprising. It was right before the transition. It's a high risk transition. The likelihood that you make it to the other side of the administration is, is uh, small. And so basically I interviewed and I basically asked, well, what do you want? And they basically said, the reason you're here is you're a researcher, you, you speak the language of research, but you have done all this innovation work. We need to learn how to work with the private sector. We need to know, have somebody who knows the DNA of a venture-funded company. We need to, and that's of course what I did. I was hanging out with you. You know, I was hanging out with uh, others, you know, in the Bay Area, I was hanging out with, you know, you know, I worked with Google as a, as a consultant, right? I did exciting, so I knew these companies. And so basically that made the transition uh, actually a, a fact, right? It, that, that enabled it. So it's not that, that all of a sudden what I did was not like extraneous and kind of a waste of time. It became the enabler. And I think that's what happens if you just do the right things. So in other words, things that you're passionate about, things that you can have an impact in, and then kind of you'll find the career. So the door open up, but I, I would, you know, I would have taken another job otherwise if this one didn't match. And as you uh, have entered into NASA with this uh, this mission of being able to change and grow, what are some of the things you've done to lead that effort? How have you gone about making that happen? It's only been what a couple of years now. No, two years. So let me tell you, the first thing I realized. So basically, I came in and told everybody, I'm not going to make any changes for a hundred days. And the simple reason for that is I think we need to have the humility to learn, not to just come in and know that we have all the answers. And I basically walked in there and I was participating in meetings and I realized that my team, I did not think I'm going to be this champion for diversity. I did not think that's what I'm going to be about. That's what the science community thinks I'm about now. But I didn't, I didn't think that. I went into the meetings and, uh, and I basically realized there's only three people talking. You know, all kind of my personality, kind of extroverts who snap to judgments, you know, and that's not healthy. You know, what I always did in every organization, I hired somebody who stopped me. You know, Eileen Wong Sot, she would like close the door and say, you're full of whatever, you know, stop it. You know, let the team, you know, and so, so I need that. I know that to be a good team. So I was there and then, you know, so I had all these hard discussions, right? I basically went to rooms and basically said, look, the last, 30 days, you spoke three times, usually to one of my female team members, and basically said, not just female, also introverted males, right? You spoke three times. Every time you spoke, it mattered. You make the team better when you speak. You need to speak more. And I went to the other people too. Like every time you speak, the discussion stops. We need your opinion, but not first, because we're cutting the discussion. And so basically, what I really focused on, in short, is the team. Really building a diverse team. I, sometimes I'm in a, a, a kind of I have kind of you know when you have these moments when you see what happened and you realize it's part of your vision. So I was just in a discussion, and we had a big argument, and some guy took me on, right? And at the end, we came up with a much better, much better answer, right? And everybody participated. Everybody walked out. This was the best discussion we've ever had about mission success, which is what it was about, and how we take risks, right? It's a hard discussion. It's not something that we. 
you could go read in a book and then sign. It's a cult, the discussion about culture, about different opinions, and you know, how they balance. So I focused on the team a lot. And then the next thing I focused on is really execution. So I basically realized that, my, yes, I'm, I'm making decisions about every single mission, whether I redo a mission, whether we move a mission forward, whether we end a mission, every decision is mine, ultimately. But what the, is your role? What is, what is the exact so responsibility? I'm the associate administra administrator. So I'm running 30% of all of NASA, all these missions. Uh, every, every key decision about this mission to, is, is basically ultimately my decision. So it's a very top-down organization, not like academia. I always say, when the dean decides something, the discussion starts. <laughs> <laughs> when I decide something, it's done. Right, I mean, so so it's a different kind of uh, organization, but we still need the the very so so I'm basically of course managing the missions and basically making sure we're doing they're doing the right things. If we have mistakes, how do we address them? I basically am also the guy speaking for science in the, the entire agency. Uh, when for many for close to one and a half years, I was the only voice in the executive uh, for science. Right, that's thirty percent of the budget. So I spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill in the White House and in other places, and of course I said strategy. Those are the three things, so uh, operations of missions, uh, really the up and out communication and the strategy. Those are the three things. Well, and the fourth thing is, is the leading people. I mean, it's the you know, building sure. the team. It's interesting, the other night, uh, I was talking about with a group of students, uh, there's four quadrants of leadership, and uh, it is the collaborative, the creative, the uh, driver, and the control type person. I said, where do you think leaders come from? They all said, oh, they come from the drive. And I said, no, they come from all four of those. And a good leader has to manage all four. You just demonstrated that. Yeah. Could you talk about how you got to that point? I mean, again, as a professor, it's a little bit unusual to go up through academia. So what are some of the roots of your philosophy and your style of leadership? So I was really fortunate. I talked to the two veterans, thanks for your service again, who are sitting in the back. There may be other veterans. And I talked to them about the mandatory service that I had to do in Switzerland. That's where my accent is from. Uh, Try to lose it, can't. <laughs> so, so I did every summer during my entire studies, I was in the service. I was in the dirt teaching, student, uh, teaching recruits how to shoot, how to throw hand grenades, how to not get lost in the woods and things like that. And I tell you, you know, if you look back, the most important thing that I did as an early leader was that because I got to know people. Like, how do you motivate somebody? It's like, you know, and also the courage of actually making your opinion known, right? Kind of the courage of asking hard questions. How can I get better? So for me, it, it kind of in an odd way, that early military stuff was really helpful because as an astrophysicist, usually we, you know, it's us and our computer and person, the, the person next to us left and right. And so, so I had this experience with thousands of people before I even got the first leadership job in my work. So I was well ahead of, I already had failed at the normal things. You know, we all fail on, you know, like, you know, how, how we do that. And then I think for me, I had, one of the things I realized is that I just can't do it by myself, right? So I always, I ask people for input, whether it's rich, other friends I ask. I, I, the way I think of it is like I built my board. And those are people who can tell you that you're wrong. And, and basically, Basically, what I got is just amazing advice from great leaders, and I started becoming a much more a listener of leadership than a kind of a, kind of a, my natural instinct is head through in the, through the wall, right? You know, I mean that's that's my I mean. By the way, it's not necessarily bad, but it's not always the right solution. Every once in a while, you meet the guy who's walking into the wall, I mean, or the class or whatever it is, and, and get through and and open up a path behind you and take some bullets. Every once in a while, that is the right thing to do, but it's not always the right style. And so, so, so kind of, I, I'm a strong believer that, you know, kind of as I do this in many different environments, that in many ways that the, our biggest strengths are also our biggest weaknesses. It just depends on time. You know, like sometimes the strength is a strength, sometimes it's your weakness. And kind of the wisdom comes from recognizing when, right? Kind of when you stepping back is the right thing to do, handing over. Basically, say you do it because your style fits better. Really interesting. Thank you. Uh, so you were in the service while you were in college. Is that that? Yeah. Sort of, could you take us back a little bit more? Because you already got to that point by what eighteen or twenty or so. 
What was your early life like, and how do you see those influences having gotten you to that point of, of being in the service of the school? Yeah, now it's getting personal. <laughs> so I, I grew up in a basically what you would call an Amish family. So you know, for a strictly Mennonite family. So I, like you know, kind of always think of, uh, uh, you know, and so I grew up there. It was really closed off in that mountain village that I grew up, and eventually I was kicked out of the family. I right? kind of just like you read in uh, in uh, in movies or in stories, I was kicked out of the family. And kind of to to a certain extent, I decided. I remember I decided not to turn bitter. Right? How I decided, old were you getting? Well, it was kind of 18 years old or so. I just basically, you know, you decide whether you want to be a grown up or not. And, and, and so for me, what it did, first of all, it made me fearless. Right? Kind of to a certain extent, almost nothing. I don't, my pulse even doesn't go high if somebody yells at me. I mean, like, okay, I've been yelled at all my youth. Right? That's fine. <laughs> and I, I actually, I told a guy recently, like, he yelled at me and said, like, look, do you realize there's only one person yelling in the room? It's not me. And I said, I've been yelled at by a lot better people than you. <laughs> <laughs> he calmed them down, by the way. He, he smiled. Of course, I smiled when I said it. But anyway, so, so for me, that kind of independence, that fierce independence, but also the real life, you know, kind of recognition that good people sometimes disagree, even though. I mean, I, I have every respect for my parents. I think my father lived a wonderful life with a lot of impact, and you know, I went to his funeral. Just recently, I, last year, 450 people showed up. All of them said he changed their, their lives. I mean, what better testament to to somebody's life? You know, I don't understand everything he did, but it didn't work out between us. We lived in different worlds, but but what that did again, it made me independent and also made me gave me the ability of kind of doing hard things because it, it's never hurting that much, right? Kind of, I mean, I found friends. I realized that that I can, other people are there to carry me, right? And sort of, so that other side, that human side is actually an important part of leadership roles of the type I have, you know, where I'm in the news sometimes. I tell my wife not to read the news, right? That or the kids that day, look, it's going to be a harsh news day. I'm in the news almost every week, right? And so. So, so there's hard decisions I'm going to have to take, and and so so basically for me it's like I know that that does not if somebody is critical about a decision you know if I do it for the right reasons not because I'm like angry or you know I do it for the right reasons that's okay even if it's going to make a cloud of dust there for a while that's okay I'm good with that. And in that regard, uh, speaking of family, uh, and, and I'm sorry for your loss of your father, I know that's profound for you, but uh, the high demand job, I mean, we, a lot of people here are executives. Uh, you moved from an executive role in a small community to an international stage. How do you keep yourself rooted to your family, to the taking care of yourself, how do you, your well-being? How do you manage that? So uh, there's an important recognition I had a few months in, into my job, and that is that I asked my assistant, like, per hour of meeting, how many requests do I get? The answer was 10. So the answer is, you can, it doesn't help to add more hours in the evening. You're never going to be successful and satisfy everybody. So you may as well carve out the time you want to spend. You know, so, so I, more meetings is not better, right? So, so, I, so basically what I did, is I put real boundaries on the day. There's never a meeting before eight except I approve it. There's always an hour of uh, office time uh, that, that I'm thinking because frankly, I can't be running, racing after people and there's always the cutoff in the evening, not because I jump out of the office then, but I'm s that the input stops. <coughs> I'm turning into, I'm, I'm starting to execute. I also, I need that regimen. I told you about my trainer, three times a week, I'm in the gym you know, three times a week I'm running. And, and the reason for that is it's my yoga, it's what centers me, it's my health, I, mean, I call it investing in my health, right? So, so I make that part of my day and in the evening, you know, the, my family is part of my day and it's scheduled that way. I try to not take home work during the weekend so I could spend every weekend meal with some stakeholder somewhere. Like I could speak in every conference, I, you know, and I, I basically say no. Actually, what I do is I actually, you know, I turn it around. I basically say I have some really young leaders, and we train them up. We train them up. They, they, they need to make the pitch just as well as me. 
and then we go out there and sometimes we put somebody in the audience and we give them feedback. Uh, that's also a rule I said, like you're in the audience for my speech, you have to give me feedback. One thing that I could do better, right? I mean, excellence comes from improvement, not from some kind of status we achieved. It's from the constant improvement that goes forward. And so for me, that's how I, so I, I try to put boundaries on my day, put things in that, that matter in my life, and also take kind of the overflow and turn it into mentorship, turn it into growth for others, because ultimately that's, uh, that's what we are all dependent on in the future. Who are your stakeholders? Yeah, it makes me the rest of the hour on that probably. <laughs> yeah, so, so you know the way I think about it. So first of all, I think of, I mean this is gonna sound a little bit big, but I, I really do think like that, you know? So, so we are right now the organization in the world that sets the speed on, on space exploration in and from space. I want historians to look at this period to say we made huge progress. I happen to be in charge of that organization right now. So for me, it's really about that. It's about what we're doing for humanity, right? It's kind of, I mean, so I think of, of it that way. The other organization, by the way, we are helping. I was just in Germany until yesterday, and we, uh, I mean, we, I met with 20 space agencies around the world, including the Chinese, everybody. Like the, the question is, how can we empower them so they come in uh, behind us. So that's one stakeholder. Of course, it's the science community. Ultimately, all the data that comes from, from these are, are dealt. I mean, we have $1.2 billion in research that goes to universities like University of Michigan, you know, the research corridor, all them, they have NASA uh, funds. Uh, that, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, also the science community worldwide. We set the standards. All our data are public. And you know, I mean, the Chinese are also realizing they're irrelevant if their data are not public. That's what leadership is about. It's not by kicking them in the chin. It's basically say, here are the standards, follow them. We come up with the standards, follow them, right? So that's, that's and they realize that they're irrelevant if they're not following. So that's, that's good. So of course, then have stakeholders on the Hill, right? They kind of ultimately, in the White House, uh, a budget is proposed and on the hill it's disposed, right? So I spent a lot of time with stakeholders that way. So it's kind of, I was really glad, yeah, I got mentors like Marvin and others at the University of Michigan to talk, teach me here that it's important to learn how to talk to that group of people. And so, so I'm spending a lot of time with senators and, you know, aides, you know, uh, you know and uh, on the hill. So, so basically, I would argue, in addition to that, of course, it's the commercial stakeholders, which are really, really critical. Kind of, we're, you know, I talk about academia, the commercial sector. Ultimately, we at NASA only want to do things that the commercial sector cannot do. So we want to hand over things. So there's many things that we used to build that we now buy services. I mean, I'm leaning forward. There's whole programs where I, it's actually only hypothetical. I may have to kill the program in three years because they cannot step up to it. But to go to the moon, I'm buying services. I basically say, hey, I want to buy by the pound, not by the flight to the surface, right? So you can sell to others, you can sell to the University of Michigan and anybody else who wants to go to the surface of the moon. I'll buy, I'll pay, buy uh, 40 pounds of services to the surface of the moon. So it's that kind of, that commercial interaction is really critical. The next question is about the flip side of how you describe your personality and that is, uh, topic of self-doubt. Uh, do you have it? And if so, how does it come up? How do you deal with it? See, I think self-confidence comes from recognizing that you don't have to be great all the time. I mean, I, of course I have doubts. I, frankly, I realized that if I don't, I'm not nervous. So I woke up like twice last night because of this talk. Uh, one of them, by the way, uh, I gave the talk and I realized I'm at the wrong Singermans. <laughs> <laughs> So, so for me, I realized that... that you need to talk about Mary about waking up at night. <laughs> I know, not for that reason. Anyway. So, but, uh, but I think it's perfectly fine to have doubts. It's also perfectly fine to recognize that we don't have to be perfect all the time. We only have to be perfect as a team, not as an individual. I'm perfectly... There's many things I don't know how to do, and I'm good with that. So confidence comes from recognizing that. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be superstars. We can just do the best we can, but empower the teams around us to kind of make sure 
that together we create perfection. Like we, we catch each other. I catch somebody, it's like, hey, give that talk differently. You could do so much better. Start differently, like comment, like, you know, some people start and say, I'm probably not right, but don't ever say that. I mean, maybe we, but none of us is probably right all the time. Don't have to say that. Just say, what are you thinking? Your opinion is valuable. Don't undercut yourself, you know? Things like that, I might mentor somebody, then I get mentored on other things. Like, shut up, Thomas. <laughs> right? So self-doubt, you know, it took me, I think, it took me like 15 years in the US not waking up at night with dreams that I'm back to where I started. You know, kind of nightmares. And kind of, I mean, and, and so I was always motivated by fear of failure. I still am, right? I think that's a perfectly good motivation. I may, I may, may be more dark than some of you see, but I mean, I'm talk, I mean, you should know, I talk to many leaders who are really amazing out there. That fear of failure part is an, I, I don't know, ask yourself, fear of failure is an important part sometimes of what drives us. It cannot be the only thing, you want to be healthy uh, too, but you know, fear of failure, and over time, add less, but uh, self-doubt is an important part of my life. And how do you deal with it? When, when it? when it really gets to the point where you're feeling it's interfering, what do you do? I ask for help. Okay. So I go back to my board. I mean, I usually, so I have a commute, 20 minutes at the end of work. Uh, probably 50% of the drives I spend on the phone with my mentors. Like, hey, like, like, how do you deal with that? Like, you know, like, can you help me think through this? Like, I'm really, or, you know, I ask my team too. I mean, I put everybody in a room and basically say, look, we have a big problem. We need good ideas. Um, let's not, I don't want a you know, discussion right now. I want a discussion, like I'll, I'll give you an example, just something that really bothers me has to do with sexual assaults at our universities that are funded by NASA money. It's a big problem. I have a daughter. I'll be darn damned if I don't do the absolute best that I can to deal with that problem from my position of power right now. So, you know, so basically, like any one of these cultural things, it's not a single action, a one and done. It's not the way you deal with these. It's to be constant, consistent, to, you know, and so, you know, so I issued a letter. You got it, right, Jim? Like, for, for everyone who has money, right, basically said, here are our values, we expect you to follow them. We're changing the rules that we actually can pull money. So we could not at this moment uh, do that. So, so it's kind of that consistency is really uh, where I think, how I think you tackle this. And it is not, it's, it's, the ideas are not mine. The ideas are coming from a broad set of community that wants to get better, right? So it's, it's kind of a ball the ocean kind of thing. You know, the risk is that you, you, you do too many things that none of which have an impact. It's more the entrepreneurial way of doing it. Do something, learn whether it makes the world better. Go back for feedback, like pivot again, go move, you know, like, but, but be consistent about the values. Namely, that our research in all of the United States should be welcome to all. Let's go, go back to the, the, the broader scheme, and maybe you could go into a few of these 34 projects, and what are the ones you're excited about? What, what, what's happening at NASA that, that you're really thrilled about? And uh, maybe you could describe where we're going. So the way to, I usually answer that is kind of what happened last week. Okay. okay, so what happened last week is this mission that I just talked about, Parker Solar Probe, flew by Venus. And uh, basically, with all the instruments on, by the way, nobody's talking about it, but all the instruments were on, I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot about Venus because the instruments are so unique. We don't wanna set these expectations, but, but I, I would take any bet that there's gonna be some papers out there that with learnings about this planet, you know, that hot planet next to us, that is, uh, that we never learn about. So, kind of, so we have this exploration of our star, I already talked about, it's one of the real keys. So we had uh, first light of ISAT-2. ISAT-2 is looking at the ice all over the Earth. It's in a polar orbit. We launched it uh, three weeks ago. And so basically it's, uh, it's six laser dots that are coming down and they're shot 10,000 times per second. And you know, because the speed of light is the speed of light. You know, if we measure the time to the, you know, fraction of a nanosecond, we actually know the distance. So we know how much ice there is everywhere on Earth. And so, what you don't know, perhaps, is that 
until even last two, five years or so, we did not know the snowfall over the Antarctic by better than a factor of two. So we all pretend we know our planet, or we, we understand, no, we don't. We're still learning about this planet in a totally new way. 15 years ago, we didn't know the rainfall over the Great Lakes by better than 20%. It matters, right? If you, if you have a place next to a lake, sure, it matters with how much, whether it rains 20% more or less. You know, it's one of the key ingredients, together with evaporation and rivers that, that bring the, 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 the water on. So, so ISAT basically takes the technology from a resolution of a football field to the resolution of a yard. So it's a factor of 100 uh, increase of performance. And so we basically can really map out these ice volumes, a critical element. If you're in the reinsurance business, reinsurance business, that's perhaps the most ingredient that tells you whether in 20 years you're gonna make money or not because that will drive, to a large extent, the, uh, the water levels in Florida, for example, and in other places. So I sat to first light, I just looked at it, over the Antarctic. Uh, it's a, a really critical thing. The other thing that also uh, happened uh, this uh, week is we, uh, uh, actually two days ago, we made an announcement that we found the first, we believe we found the first exomoon. So remember exoplanets, uh, 1995, the first planets were discovered outside of the solar system, where now between three and 4,000 we're discovering all the time. We just have a, a mission that just started spitting out new ones. We had Kepler, and it's coming to the end. Uh, very soon we're done, we're out of fuel. TESS is up there now, and it's, it's spitting out data. So, but we just found exomoons, the first exomoon, we think. It's still a little bit shaky. But it's a crazy system. So it's basically the planet is like Jupiter and the moon is like Neptune. Huh. So kind of that, imagine a world like this. So it's kind of shaking on the planet. Now the problem is that any model that we thought makes moons is not working <laughs> for that world. And that's why you look at the world, right? So, so everything we learn about exoplanets basically helped us understand what's important about our solar system. In 1995, the vast majority of planetary system, solar system theories, they died that year. Because it was the only thing that these models said, there have to be rocky planets on the inside and gas planets on the outside and nothing in between. So first of all, the most abundant planets in all the universe are planets that are between Rockies and the gas planets. Right in the middle there, super Earth and many Neptunes are the most abundant planets. We just don't happen to have one, right? So, so, so we're wrong if, if all we look at is ourselves, at our own navel. We have to look at nature to learn about ourselves. Can you imagine what happens when we find the second life? Like how we all some can think about that transition between chemistry to biology, right? And if we don't know what that, how that works, there's tremendous biologists working at it, but imagine uh, we do that. So for me, those are kind of the highlights. Wow, this is really exciting. Uh, you mentioned one other thing that, that I'm quite fascinated about, and that is, uh, in our personal lives, what should we be learning from science? I mean, what, what lessons can we take from the, the research you do in terms of how we live our lives? There he is. Tower. He reset his watch already. <laughs> it's a long drive. <laughs> to, me, to me, science is about two things, I believe. The first one is the importance of curiosity. I mean, you know, I, I remember I read as a, as a young researcher Feynman's book, how he describes how he was walking with his father. And the father asked him simple questions like, why, why is the term why is the tree turning red to green, uh, green to red in fall, this way as opposed to any other way? Like, where are the atoms from that are in the tree? Well, they're from the air, right? It's like, you know, so, so it's these kind of simple questions, like, of course, the, every kid that has asked you, why is the sky blue, right? It's like, well, the, that's a hard answer, but let me try, right? So curiosity, I just believe is such an important element uh, of a science, and I hope we never lose it. Curiosity is what makes us learn more, and kind of the moment where stop being curious, our world shrinks. It doesn't stay the same, it, it, it shrinks. And so kind of curiosity is how we make the world bigger in which we live and think. Now the second one is humility. I believe that looking at nature makes you feel, as I said, it's more important than us. 
It makes you feel that there's more to it than whatever just hit me in the face in my email or, or whatever. It, it's the night sky, I think, is one of the most important things we could be looking at. It's ultimately why I turned into an astrophysicist. It's the beautiful night skies that I grew up under. And kind of the, the, the recognition that these things are important. So for me, those are the two things. There's a third one, of course, and that is it makes our lives better. Science, ultimately, is where, where a lot of these innovations that many of you are working on are originating. And we want that. We're trying really hard to, to drive technologies out to make sure that companies are picking up these technologies, growing products, make improved lives uh, around, you know, whether they help protect it through the predictions of storms uh, or some other way. You know the hurricanes we just had? The big story about the hurricane seasons the last two years is A, every one of these hurricane, hurricanes was predicted not only in trajectory but the amount of water and that was the first in the previous years that did not happen in just Florence right now we knew it was predicted well because we have the tools by the way the key tool that is being used by by our sister agency NOAA for that is a research tool that we're flying uh, the you know GPM global precipitation monitor so we're using, we have technologies to provide data that really helps. So that's the third piece, I would say, just the, the utility of science. The, the why is all three of them, but for me, it's in that order. One of them that I think about uh, as I look at the world and the problems of the world is, is the lack of understanding about probability and statistics. So you hear people talk about, I'm sure of this, uh, or this has to be the case. The lack of being able to understand really the scientific method. Could you talk about how that plays out as you see the world scene? Uh, do you agree with that? Or how, what's your observations about that? I actually think, you know, so some of you are university people. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like an educator still. I actually think this is a real challenge, friends. That our students that get degrees across the University of Michigan, I'll just pick that. I could take Harvard, I could take Northern Michigan University, a university I love. I could take any university, a community college, the fact that our students get degrees and they don't understand the principles of science and they don't have a feeling for numbers. In every way, those are as essential for life as is learning about Shakespeare, as is learning about our history, as is learning about our business. language, business, whatever they are. They're part of the liberal arts curriculum and science is part of it. And you know, I've, I mean, I. I've met many people on the social science side that kind of belittled science. And I think we're paying a big price for that. The fact that, that our students, graduates from proud universities like the one in town here, uh, do not know this. I think, I, to me, there needs to be a clarion call, call for these educational institutions, basically say, this needs to be addressed. Because I believe if we're not doing that, kind of that world of uh, have truth, that word, world of my opinion counts, not actual data. Uh, that world uh, is going to do like it we fear it is sometimes even now. From that, uh, you're, 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 you do use statistics, you do use probability. What are you worried about in the world? What are, if you take three or four the things that you worry most about that really could happen that we're not paying enough attention to or that we're being in denial, or, or just we, we think about, but what, what worries you about what the world for your children? So I'm gonna, it's hard to prioritize this. I do worry that we're not taking seriously the signals that we're getting from our planet. We have some real challenges in our planet. I, I worry that as a science community, um, because of the pressure sometimes we're getting from one or the other side, you know, if it's vaccinations, it's from this side, it's, it's climate change, it's from the other side. It's the same discussion. It's kind of, we'd rather have our opinions than science, right? I worry that as a science community, we, the way I talk about it is we leave the high ground of science too often. So basically, we, we leave the high ground of science because somebody pushes up, but we leave the high ground of science because somebody claps. Like we say things that are not true. I'll give you an example, just so you know. So we had a uh, we had a big press conference, uh, yes, with the Trump administration on CO2. We have a spacecraft that is measuring CO2, carbon dioxide, with 
unprecedented accuracy and time resolution. So we did a press conference. By the way, that was a batch on the moment, on the table moment for me. I basically said, we will tell every story, but we'll tell them like scientists. By the way, the whole power uh, structure agreed with that. So, so basically, so there's no, just, just so we know, there's, we did that press conference. I got that press conference written by our scientists. I, we found, me and the Earth Science Direct, we found three statements in there that were not true. They were exaggerated. It's, a, it's the highest CO2 ever measured. That was no case. Her own data showed that three years ago it was higher. Like, it is high, but don't make statements that are not true, right? So do you see what I mean with the high ground of science? Don't let, stick, be a scientist, right? So for me, uh, that is kind of relative to our Earth, that is really important, kind of really regain that high ground of science and really talk about it the right way. That's issue one. Uh, I would argue that as a, a guy who works in space, I'm worried that the space is turning into a domain that uh, is contested. Uh, we basically, in space, we're clearly the dominant player, uh, but that's, there's a number of countries that are contesting that, and um, we have to figure out how to deal with that. It's a complicated situation. How do we deal with our values of openness and that con being contested, there's a lot of stuff that's happening that is not comfortable. I mean, it's not, it's not just a matter of interpretation. As it were con contested in each one of those domains. It's how kind of we want to make sure that space is that common good and it stays that way, right? So we're not uh, drifting off into a place where, where we don't want to be. So but dealing with that, the political realities, the international political realities and that I think it's, it's a struggle we're going to go through in the next few years at a, at a level we haven't ever in the past, not even during a Cold War. Thank you very much. I, I know that there's a lot of eagerness in the audience, and let me just ask, uh, I know we, we get questions, but what do you, what do you want from our, this audience? What would you like to hear from them uh, in terms of, uh, you mentioned about getting better, but uh, you're back in Ann Arbor. What, what, what kind of questions do you have for the audience? Well, I'd like to know what happened in the last two years. I, there's some amazing things, you know. Like, of course, I, I, I follow some of you on Twitter. I, I listen. I read. I read, uh, I, you know, the news in Ann Arbor on a regular basis. But, you know, what, what did I miss that is really cool? I mean, I'm, I love uh, some of the companies did not work out. That's fine. That's what happens when we do entrepreneurship and more power to the ones that that close the company down and start the next one. I mean, I'm just, I'm proud of you, Don. I mean, just really, I mean, to me, to me, that's what it's about. That's how we're turning the culture and everybody should celebrate that in, in a direct fashion. But I'd like to learn, like, what else did I miss? Okay, and how about uh, feedback? What kind of feedback would you like from them? You said you want to get better. What, 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 you, what are you curious about? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to learn ways that we talk about science that were not that would resonate, a ways kind of opportunities that we have to get better, or perhaps mistakes that we're making, uh, talking about uh, what we're doing in a way that turns off people kind of inadvertently without us knowing. So I'd really like to learn about, um, you know, some of you are professional communicators, some of you are, you know, fundraisers. You, I mean, you're all about messaging. Rich is fun fundraiser. He's a, He's a, joy, a joy writer. A joy writer. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but let's, let's do it this way. We've got a, a few minutes left. What I like to do, Thomas, is ask people to just turn to maybe groups of four and process a little bit about Thomas, what he said, and see if we can come up with some questions for him based on the, the community here of, of, of press, rather than just asking for individuals to ask questions. There's lots of experts, lots of people Thomas has referred to, so turn around, just groups of four or five, and uh, talk for maybe five minutes and then see if you can give Thomas some questions. You're welcome to, you know, listen in if you'd like. All right. Okay? Lot of the great things that are going on in our universities, 
And we're trying to translate that into language um, that is both interesting and meaningful to people and their lives, right? So they care. Because we do. We have a big job in, in, in overcoming people's either apathy or worse, hostility towards science. And so I think my question for you is, how, how do you do that? And are you working a lot, like what's the role of professional communicators and marketers? Because that's the road that we're going down. And I, you know, that's not what I'm, I'm a trained social scientist. So I, don't, I don't understand communications that well. And even though I'm a quick study, I can't do it like some people <coughs> yeah. But it's hard to get them, you know, where's that middle ground? Like, that's my question. So the first thing you should know is that we have professional communication courses and I'm sending every director to it. And so basically, and those are done uh, by the Alda Center, you know, I mean, kind of, I mean, kind of, uh, so they're done outside of NASA and they're focused on, uh, you know, social science insights, they're, they're focused on, on that. So I believe that we all can learn. One of the biggest uh, kind of lucky days for me was the first class I taught at the University of Michigan, I had a Knight Wallace fellow in the back of my room. She asked, can I, it's a BBC science correspondent, she asked, can I be in the class? I said, I make you a deal. You can be in the class, but you train me on communication. <laughs> Best deal I ever made. <laughs> I learned more than she did, I'm sure. And, but uh, but uh, So I'm a strong believer in that. You know, for me, instead of answering directly what's the most important thing, uh, I'll tell you, I grew up in this mountain town. I was kind of the only scientist. And, and I, at fourth grade, I left because I went to school, and, uh, and uh, there was a voluntary firefighter uh, type of thing. You know, I, I stayed at my parents because I couldn't really afford a, a room, but so I, instead of paying 150 bucks, I volunteered to be a firefighter. And so I was hanging out with these amazing people, the farmers, the butcher, the, the, the guy who carried the mail, right? Uh, we, we were hanging out, and it took like, four months or so, all of a sudden they came to me. And I know they had organized it. The girls, they all came at once and said, we wanted to ask you a question. Why do you study the stars? Why is that important? We don't understand. And so, so I, I told, it was a beautiful night, kind of a beautiful night with the stars, and I said, look at the star. It's the North Star, you know that. You know it's variable. It's the one star that we all look at to figure out where north is, and it's variable. <laughs> you see that star over there, and I pointed to one off in Orion. See, look at it. It's not a star. It's a gas nebula. It's, it's something that's totally different. I looked at another one and said, it's also another star. That's Venus. And so basically, I talked about nature the way they understand nature. And the way they understand, I talked about the beauty of nature, not the physics of stars. I talked about the fact that when we study, nature becomes more beautiful, not more intellectual. Mm -hmm. And so for me, what I, so the short answer to your thing, the most important part in science communication is to bring empathy with it. It's not so much about, it's like entrepreneurship. Whether or not you have a successful product is not whether you thought well about the product, it's whether somebody wants it. So think about the recipients and basically figure out whether they can get the message. Empathy is the vehicle for that. Understand the recipient. And so for me, I spend a lot of time. I kind of every time I go somewhere, you know, somewhere in the U.S. or somewhere abroad, I ask to speak to high schoolers or I ask to speak to some community group because I want to train up, or make sure, you know. And I, I, I read body language as a 20-year educator. I read body language, right? So, so for me, for me, I'm kind of really trying that, and, and, and I, I wish, you know, kind of, I mean, Jim uh, and our group, we always did that. We did an experiment at the Detroit Science Center, and we staffed it. I'm proud of my team that did that here, right? Because it's important not just to do the science, but to communicate it to all communities. And so, so that's what I would, if, if your training is great, but also the attitude is very, very important. We're not smarter because we have PhDs, we just have different educations. There's many farmers are as smart as PhDs, many times over. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is, my question is, given the proliferation of international activity in space, 
these days being more crowded up there. Uh, what is your thought, or, or can you tell us what is NASA's position relative to the Space Force that's being proposed in Washington these days? Sure. Well, the one thing you should know about me, the, the one thing that I really appreciate is I get trained to answer hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> so all these questions I see in a mile ahead. <laughs> Not me, my team. Uh, look, um, the Space Force comes from, a, from, the, from the basic recognition that I share. By the way, whether there's Democrats in the room, Republicans, they would agree with the statement I made, which is that if they have the information, which is that uh, space is a, a place that is becoming more contested, like the oceans, like land, like, you know, it's a domain. And uh, the Space Force is one way to address that. I think uh, what, whether or not this is the way it's going to be, I don't know. This is a discussion that's going on right now, as you know, kind of to, to, to start a new uh, mm -hmm. part of the service requires congressional approval so that's a big campaign that's going on the one thing that's at the heart of it though is something we should think about which is what do we want space to be in the future like do we want space to be a place where we can operate freely I really hope I don't have to put up a spacecraft every time and kind of fly a second spacecraft with it to defend the spacecraft that's up there right and so so you think that's a dream it's not so for me for me that's how I think about it. Is the Space Force a good idea? Let the process work out. I believe in our political process. Let it work out. I don't know. But the point is, the issue at hand, I agree with, is absolutely important to have a discussion about kind of really the conflict of values, uh, the value of safety and the value of openness. That struggle is a really important struggle that this country has had many times over. So we have other democracies. So this is another one of those discussions in a very, in a complex place, because many of us don't have a really good feeling for what space is about and what's, uh, what's really happening. Yes? Yeah. And then I'll come back to you next. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again uh, for coming. This was, uh, uh, this was great. So I, I heard a couple things. One, uh, you mentioned when, when you touched on at NASA, you know, attendant diversity uh, when you arrived at NASA was something important to you, right? You talked about uh, right, getting people to speak more who were speaking less, and then the opposite for the, uh, the other cohort. Two, I heard you mention uh, that university is doing a disservice uh, to students by not understanding the principles of science, right, and, and, and numbers basics. And then third, I heard you mention you have a daughter. I also have a daughter. Um, would love to know your thoughts on um, increasing <coughs> diversity in NASA from a, a both gender and race perspective, uh, right, and what role you and uh, NASA overall have and right, starting early with our, with our children, right, in programs like STEM? Uh, we strongly believe in that. So for me, the way I think about diversity, and I just want to make that statement one more time, is it's an element of excellence. Like, I want the best discussion in the room. That's why I have a diverse, that's why I want diverse uh, backgrounds, gender, whatever, right? I want different people with different ideas empowered to speak up included into the discussion. It's, for me, diversity is about excellence. It's not an end and it's, it's not some kind of icing on the cake, it's the cake. We want to be the best, we want to be the best organization. I want to build the best team that beats every other team in terms of speed, in terms of excellence and performance. For that, I, I can't have groupthink. You know, you know, fraternities are not good decision makers, generally speaking, right? So, because they, they snap to judgment too fast, and so for me, for me, that's how I think about it. That starts early, so the communication uh, starts early, and so that it, uh, to me, that's the our communication. I put a lot of effort. We we have something like you know we have between fifty and hundred million dollars in science focused on spreading science uh, through partnerships and communities, you know, through uh, many different ways. I put I put personal effort on social media. I put personal effort on writing blogs personally. I put, you know, many of us bring other elements to the table, but it's absolutely critical that we do so. And I get one more question in the yeah. back there. Yeah. The news seems to indicate that science is under assault. How do the average person support? Can you repeat the question? I will repeat the question. 
you say that news indicates that science is on our soul, how can the average person support you? Really through the elements that I suggested, be curious yourself. Model a scientifically inquisitive behavior to your environment and talk about the beauty of nature and the importance of science. That's, that's the most important one. When you think about how you make decisions, whether it's about your political leaders, whether it's about uh, your community leaders, think about those as an element of consideration. It's not the only element, it's not, in many cases, not the most important element, but it's, a, it's an element of considerations by how we think about the world itself. And so for me, uh, that's, that's the best. But the, the most important part is what you do yourself, right, to your family, to your environment. Really model that, um, that um, be scientific behavior. Uh, thankfully, you know, the, the Congress and you know, the, the political system is such, and I'll repeat again, that we have, uh, thankfully, we have a really uh, solid uh, research budget. And so many of the fears that perhaps were out there at the beginning did not materialize. And that is not just, I just want to say, it's not just because of some one individual you know, on Capitol Hill. It's also, uh, people forget that many great people who work within the White House and do the right thing. They're doing the right thing. There's many people right now who are doing the right thing. And so, so uh, as you think through that, don't don't judge, you know, the book by its cover. Right? There's many uh, just great citizens and uh, patriots who are are helping uh, to helping science, helping other parts of the government uh, be successful. <coughs> One part we didn't talk about uh, that I think is different from what you're doing at the university, what you're doing now, is people that you're responsible for, the lives of people. And that, Bill, Bill Milliken, come up just a second if you can. Bill told me a story. He worked six months at NASA. And a uh, very interesting six months. Could you just describe what you experienced it? And well, maybe you could ask Thomas the question. I got up this morning with some pride put my NASA pin on my belt. <laughs> Uh, I did. I, was, I worked in Washington, D.C. for three years, uh, six months of which was at NASA. It, uh, I was hired by the Associate Administrator for External Affairs, who would be a counterpart of Thomas. <coughs> Proud to be there. Exciting time. Unfortunately, it coincided with the explosion of the Challenger. And, uh, and uh, it was, we were working uh, diligently to promote the teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe who at the time was the, uh, the star of the uh, flight. And uh, it was a tremendous personal loss. It was a tremendous uh, organizational loss. And uh, NASA changed after that. The Rogers Commission decided that people who were in senior positions at the agency needed to have flight experience, preferably military. And, and uh, the whole organization <coughs> changed after that. And it brought my tenure at the agency to a close, too. So the question, I guess, is the people side. How do you think about that when you say human in space and that kind of awesome responsibility? I would argue that next year is going to be a hugely pivotal year for all of NASA, and it has precisely to do with the question that you're that you're addressing, and it has to do with the U.S. bringing people back from U.S. soil into space. We have two commercially funded launch capabilities, one by SpaceX, one by Boeing, and we're building our own uh, space launch system. If everything goes well, in two years, we have three systems that can bring people up and down in space. But we know, kind of from history, whenever we bring something on, even if we try ever so hard, usually one of three fails or a uh, fresh system. Now the question is, how do we deal with that? You know, how do we deal with that? Kind of struggling with that risk. It's risk to life. Whenever, you know, when a space mission fails, that's a huge disaster. It's hundreds of millions of dollars, but nobody got killed, typically, right? I mean, we, ha we, haven't, we haven't had any accidents that killed anybody <coughs> in many, many years. You know, this is a not a but moment. But, 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 when we launch our astronauts, and I know, I know these astronauts. Every one of them is, 
you know, they walk on water, it feels like, but you know, every one of them is you know, special in their own way. The question is, how do we deal with that risk? Now, NASA has always been about that. Like, our goal is not to do the no-risk version of the world, because the, 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 the least risky thing is to stay on the ground. <laughs> like, we want to fly. We take risks. I'm very nervous every launch, right? You see this thing. Marcus Solar we launched connection with one of the with one of the upper stages for a few minutes. I was a nail biter. Because the simple reason usually when you lose connection it's because something exploded up there. Right? And it just was a communication problem. So so it's that kind of discussion. I think we're gonna have a struggle in the next year that uh, focuses entirely on that. We need to relearn how to do that if we haven't already. Thomas, I want to thank you so much for coming back. And, uh, Thomas uh, actually mentioned this as he was leaving a few years ago because I had invited him to come to Leaders Connect when he was still at the university. He said, well, I can't make it, but I promise you I will be back. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, we'll see. <laughs> uh, so he called me uh, you know, maybe six months ago and said, Rob, I promised you uh, I, I want to come back. I'm going to be in Ann Arbor on October 5th. And, uh, I want to make that true, so I really appreciate you coming very much. Thanks, Dale. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Eric, uh, that's going to be a tough act to follow next month. Could you just shout out a little bit about what you plan for? Uh, we're going to talk about leadership from a military perspective, and Eric is. Uh, Better in the manner of in the Navy, and so what were you talking about here? Thanks, Rob. Yeah, so we talked about um, as part of the, sort of the Veterans Week kind of theme that we would uh, focus on the, the military experiences of myself, and I've got another really great uh, Navy guy here, Len Heidel, who is the executive officer of the Navy ROTC unit. It's kind of nice because we both graduated from this institution and graduated from that program back in the 80s, one year after each other, gone off, had our careers, and find ourselves back in the same spot. We both agree that we've had a lot of really good experience. The Navy is very much a crucible where you, you learn to lead or you go away, basically, in the military. And then we've also had sort of careers outside of that where we've been able to apply a lot of those lessons. And he and I both do either classes or lectures on this that have been pretty well received. So kind of package that up for you, give you kind of like that top five or 10%. Some pretty funny stories of, uh, as you might imagine, from over the years. And those will all be stories that lead to specific little nuggets. Right? So, so it should be a really good, uh, really good time. And uh, I hope to have a few other people come in. If you have some people with military experience and leadership, uh, we might put a little panel together to react. One of the people I want to invite is my friend Nick Luxon, who uh, in 1968 went to Vietnam. And uh, he and I were at the same sort of crossroads, and uh, he decided to, to go into the Army. I decided to try to find a deferment and went to teach in New York City. Nick was wounded at, in the war and has never been the same since. And, but he has reconstructed his life uh, to work with veterans. So uh, I want to have Nick come up and uh, from Ferndale, where we both grew up, and talk. And there may be some other folks that uh, could share their experiences. I know, where's uh, Carol Cam? Carol's still there? Yeah, Carol's talking about her son training to be an astronaut. So uh, you know, that's another thing that we, we, we could discuss. So anyway, thanks again, Thomas. I don't, you probably have to run, I assume, to, or do you have a few minutes? A few minutes, yeah, a few minutes. Yeah, okay, great. Minutes, yeah. Are you the tour guide today? <laughs> yes, it's the ride. All right, the ride, okay. Well, they, feel free to hang out in here as long as you like and uh, to visit with each other, do some power networking. Uh, we can identify people and maybe there's somebody you can meet and become friends with. Thank you very much.